Today on Lockdown Red Wings, Ben Sherratt's OT winner gives Detroit their first ever win against Seattle and helps them split the road trip to Western Canada. Your Locked On Red Wings, your daily podcast on the Detroit Red Wings, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back to the Locked On Red Wings podcast. We are your hosts, Brian Fisher and Scotty Bentley. I'm a podcast producer for the Daily J, a WWJ News Radio podcast. Well, Scotty's host over at Locked On Tigers, as well as a freelance journalist for the Detroit News. And today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get 150 bonus bucks with any $5 bet. That's 150 bucks if your first bet wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On to get started. Scotty, what a game we had out in Seattle this la- this after we can say this afternoon because this will probably premiere Friday evening. So we can say this afternoon. Uh, what a game out there in Seattle, wasn't it, buddy? Absolutely, man. Just uh, I mean, a lot of really good hockey. Uh, maybe good isn't even the right word. A lot of crazy hockey, I guess, <laughs> around the league. Hot. Yeah, right. Around the league on Monday, obviously the the Wild and Canucks game was wild. That is for sure. Hey. Um, but yeah, great hockey game, man. I, I think that that is one where the league is happy that uh, that, that game ended up looking how it looked because that was a really close back and forth game. Obviously, overtime's always fun and uh, led to a led to a game winner. So, yeah, absolutely. It was it wasn't a pretty game at times. Uh, the first period was Certainly really not. rough which I think is a really good segue right into our difference makers for the uh, episode uh, for this game against the Seattle Kraken. And Scotty, I'm going to go to you first because, you know, we talked about it beforehand and I know who your difference maker is. <laughs> who is your difference maker for the game against the Seattle Kraken? Yeah, it's going to be Alex Lyon. And I know that uh, some people give him a little bit of heat for falling down on that one goal, given up to uh, to tie the game there. But uh, he had what thirty eight saves, thirty mm-hmm. faced over forty shots, uh, and uh, really, I think is the sole reason that the Wings were even in the game, nonetheless tied after one. Uh, that was a really sluggish start to the game by the skaters for the Wings and Lion and the defense. I know that you want to talk about as well early on. Um, the defensemen, I should say, uh, early on, it certainly played a little bit of a factor as well but yeah man they see it was all seattle for almost all of that first period and we walked out of there one to one because of how good lion was so um yeah obviously again the the little i guess we'll call it a mistake there just slipping and allowing that goal late in the game obviously isn't a great look but he was fantastic in this game uh outside of that yeah i mean it it was a bad look and it was obviously the whole team was getting caved in on the defensive zone and and on that play Seattle was cycling the puck like crazy. And then it was a delayed penalty. So they were able to do whatever they wanted in the offensive zone, their offensive zone rather. And because they couldn't get any resistance against Alex Lyon or for Alex Lyon, that puck came across and it just, he, he went to lateral and he fell and it was a bad look. It sucked, but Outside of that, he was fantastic. I mean, you're not even in that game if it's not for Alex Lyon in that first period, especially because that first period was rough by the Detroit Red Wings. Like they just they didn't look like they were going to have a game (laughs) in that first period. And he kept them in it and they were lucky to walk away with a first period tie. And it wouldn't have happened without him. Um, And then I'm going to go to the opposite end of the spectrum. You talking at the end of there about the first period. I'm going to go to overtime. My difference maker is Ben Sherratt. (laughs) <laughs> no more simply than he scored the game winner. Unlikely hero. Pretty objective uh, difference maker. Right. On that right. One. Pretty, pretty, pretty tough to argue against uh, an OT game winning score for sure. His his goal sort of kind of made the difference in this game, you could say. Yeah, you could argue the difference, <laughs> the sole difference between one and two points. Yeah. And that was his, what, his third goal of the season. He, you know, the defense as a whole, minus Olimata, who I guess we should talk about when we get to notable performances. Uh, I thought they played a pretty good game. And I know people are going to be like, whoa, did you watch the hockey game? And I just mentioned how the entire time in the defensive zone on that goal where Lyon tripped and fell, they were just getting cycled and caved in. 
But I attribute that more towards the how the forwards played in this hockey game than the defense. I felt, especially in that first period when the team was sluggish, the forwards were just their forecheck was non-existent. They weren't getting into position. The defense would win the puck battles in the corners. They'd chip it up to the wingers, and the wingers would turn it over. I felt like a lot of that game was Alex Lyon. A lot of that first period especially was Alex Lyon and the defense just trying to keep the team afloat. And that's what happened. So I thought the defense, Ben Chirot, Jeff Petrie, Sider, uh, Wolman, I know if you look at their analytics, because they got caved in in shots in general in this game and shot attempts like every other game because it's just how the Red Wings play hockey. They do quality over quantity. Isn't going to look good, but I, I got to say, like, I didn't think that they had a bad game. Again, minus Olimata. So, yes, Ben Sherratt's my difference maker because he obviously scored the goal that made the difference in this hockey game. Unlikely hero, assisted by Larkin and Raymond. Uh, but I thought the defense as a whole, I mean, they this Seattle Kraken team forechecks really freaking hard, Scotty. Really freaking hard. They're fast. They forecheck hard. And the defense and Alex Lyon, you know, even if it was on their heels a lot of the time, they did just enough to keep those pucks out of the back of the net more times than you were putting it in the back of theirs. So, I mean, I got to give it to the defense and to the uh, and to Ben Chirot for being the difference maker. Yeah, no, you you can compliment a group and and still understand that there's uh, you know it wasn't perfect, right? Like they 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 did enough to win, and that's a really sometimes all you're going to ask for uh, on the last game of a West Coast road trip like that. I think. Uh, I'm just happy to get out of there with two points. And I, and to your point, I think the defense did enough. There were a few plays too. I think in the second period specifically, um, that was where Seattle at one point, obviously we, we talked about, they kind of dominated the first as far as just opportunities. But uh, in the second, you know, the, the tide really started shifting a little bit and the wings kind of held their ground a little bit more in that second when a, the wings forward started forechecking more. I mean, we even saw, couple of moments where Patrick Kane was like aggressive on the four check and whatnot. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, but, um, and, and Alex DeBrinkett played defense for one play. There's a turn uh, <laughs> for one play, <laughs> right? It's well, <laughs> no, I meant, I meant played defense men for a play, not played defense for one play that, but you could uh, argue, but, um, he, uh, he had to slide and cycle back and play as a makeshift defenseman and made a good play. Right. Um, so the, I, I think as the game went along, they kind of found, their sea legs a little bit, but, uh, but the defenseman, I, I, you know, to your point with Sherratt, like obviously he scored the game winner, but um, him and Petrie had a couple of, uh, a couple of really good plays in our zone together in the second period specifically there was, uh, and I think that that kind of stopped the, maybe not shifted the momentum straight up to the wings favor, but at least stopped the yeah. rush after rush and, and possession game that Seattle was winning so much early on in the game. So um, yeah, I, uh, I'm with you there. And of course, I mean, I guess we're kind of transitioning now into like notable players type stuff now, yeah. uh, to continue with the defensive talk. We, you, you mentioned there, Sherrod and Petrie, but of course, Sider and Wolman too, even though they'll be at the bottom in Corsi four percentage and expected goals four yeah. percentage because they play the most minutes. It's the toughest to be yada, yada, yada. We've been there, done that. Sider had six block shots in this game, led the team. He made some really nifty plays for breakouts from the defensive zone that sometimes led to turnovers by the forwards, but you know, he was doing everything. He had, he broke up a couple two on ones. Uh, obviously he had that first goal of the game. So the defense was doing a little bit of everything. Two of the four goals came from the back end. And then of course, you know, all the plays they made in the defensive zone with the assist assistance of Alex Lyon and net again, not to, not to beat the dead horse and circle back too much and ramble. But again, from the first period, they were lucky to come out of it one, one, and it's because of the defense and because of Lyon. And they continued that through as the ball got rolling and the Red Wings began to play better hockey through the next two periods. So, I mean, credit to just everyone, but I mean, I guess from there we can, if we're going to keep with the, trend of defense i guess we could talk about olimata at the start of segment two because i might as well just wrap up all the defense we're going to yeah. talk about all the defensemen apparently in this might game well. against the seattle kraken so we're going to go to a slightly early break but then when we come back we'll talk about olimata because what a hot and cold game from him uh in this one so stay tuned to lockdown red wings 
Get buckets with your first bet on FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Because right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any $5 bet. That's $150 if your bet wins. Bet on all your NBA players and teams with quick bets, live same-game parlays, exclusive props, and more. Just visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOn to shoot your shot. FanDuel, official sportsbook partner of the NBA. Segment two, Lockdown Red Wings podcast. Scotty and our just incessant talking of the defense today. I don't know if we've ever talked about defense as much as we are today. We've talked about pairings and players, but not the whole defensive core as much as we've talked about in this hockey game. But what a crazy game for a guy like Olimata uh, in this one. He obviously, I think the two that are going to stand out from to most people are the Jared McCann goal where he did not get inside positioning and was just trying to poke it away from Jared McCann's stick when McCann was all alone with, in front of Lyon. Like that's a spot where if you're Olimata, you have got to get inside positioning or tie him up. You cannot be the outside guy because you're just, you're giving up a goal in that instance. And then of course, late in the game, he makes that dumb cross check to give the Red Wings a penalty kill with a minute 45 left in regulation in a tie game. Those two play, if, if the Seattle Kraken had scored on that power play, he would have been this game's difference maker for both of us because right. those two plays directly would have led to two goals against. But thankfully, the penalty kill bailed him out, and so he avoids those honors. On the same note, he whiffed on a wrist shot coming down the wing. JT Comfer set him up beautifully for a one-timer, and he didn't get anything on that, although credit to Seattle defense. There was a diving play that got a stick on it. But at the same time, if you look at his metrics in this game, he and Shane Gossisbear led the team in expected goals, four percentage and Corsi four percentage in this hockey game. Now, granted they play the fewest minutes against the easiest competition. They get a lot of offensive zone starts because of those, those factors. You're going to give most of your starts in the defensive zone to Sider Wallman. So those are huge parts of why they typically are leading the team in those metrics. Cause they get pretty soft deployments, but they still played 17 minutes of ice time and they had like 22 shot attempts for and 12 shot attempts against when they were on the ice at five on five. So it's like the overall scope of their game in this one, pretty good with the exception of like two or three big glaring mistakes by Olimata. So, I mean, yeah, notable player, almost a difference maker for the wrong reasons. For sure. Yeah. That, honestly, I, I think the second most frustrating thing for me was, um, him coming out of the box in overtime he came out of the box and and they the wings were on the rush right when he came out of the box and uh after you know a minute or a minute and a half or whatever of seattle puck possession to start off overtime olimata gets the puck on his stick and tries to force just like you know kind of barreling into right in front of the net and tries to force a opportunity loses the puck you know isn't able to to get the puck off his stick it just gets poked away and then thankfully Lucas Raymond gets the puck back pretty quickly thereafter, you know, five seconds later at the blue line. But I I was more upset at him for that than maybe anything except for the, the cross check because I, it's just, you know, overtime's a possession game. And to not have possession for so long and then not even get a really that good of an opportunity and just give it away, like, immediately would have been really frustrating. So, yeah, I, I feel like maybe just moments of trying to do too much. Um, I've liked what Olimata has provided this team this year. This is, you know, just a bad game and move on type of yeah. thing. Um, I, I still prefer him. I think him and ghost have been, uh, have been pretty serviceable and I, yeah, I, I think that, uh, that, that Mata has been, been good in the role that we expected of him this year. So, it, you know, not a change my outlook of him on the season, like, too big of an overreaction here, but certainly for one game, uh, rough outing there by by Mata. Oh yeah, I'm not trying to execute Oli Mata on the podcast today. This was no, a sure. this was an outlier of a game for him. He's not a dirty player. He doesn't take many penalties, and normally he's defensively sound. So a lot of those instances where, you know, in an instance today where he didn't get the inside positioning, nine times out of ten he's going to. So this was an abnormally bad game for a guy like Oli Mata. And like you were saying with overtime, like he was only out there because he came out of the box. Normally right. he wouldn't even set foot on the ice in overtime that's not his role because of course he's going to make a play like that which is why he doesn't play overtime right so, and i think your point for the analytics is is i think that is really all there is to say about it like he you know 
third third pairing, easiest deployment, easiest quote unquote deployment. Um, and uh, and and yeah, I think that that's pretty much the the sole reason you see that stuff. But I, I didn't think that the pair was like their pairing was just a liability all night though, right? Like, I mean, he had some some bad plays, but as far as, again, what you were talking about earlier, as far as the defensive performances from the defenseman, I didn't think that, you know, that pairing was just a liability out there either. So, yeah, uh, yeah just a couple of, of plays in a vacuum that uh, he wants back, I'm sure. And uh, thankfully, Wings still got two points out of it. So yeah. uh, if, if, you're, if your worst game of the year comes when your team still wins – um, we'll, we'll take that. Absolutely. Uh, another notable player. I think you'd be remiss without mentioning it. Lucas Raymond, two points in this game. Uh, he gets, that's his 45th and 46th point on the season, surpassing his season total from last season in 19 fewer games as well. They said on the broadcast and I, I'm, I didn't have time to double check, but I'm going to assume ESPN got their analytics, right? that he currently leads all U21 players in points this season. So that's a pretty, pretty big deal for a guy like Lucas okay. Raymond, drafted fourth overall. He's on pace to smash his career high of, what, 57 points he set in his rookie year. Yeah. He's had a hell, of a, a hell of a season. He's on a huge heater since the new year turned. He's been great. And right now, I think that's his 51st game played because he missed a little bit of time to, a little bit of time to injury earlier in the season. Uh, was that this year? No, he's played 54 games, so that would set straight up. He's played every single game. I'm yeah, thinking last say, year. I think that was the end of last season. Yeah, it was last year he missed a little bit of time. I don't, everything's blurring together. But he has 46 points in 54 games, which is a really good pace for a 21-year-old. So Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And, and again, when we've uh, we've also seen a little bit of the line blender the last few games as well, and he really hasn't missed a beat. And I think that's honestly maybe one of the contributors – as to why, right? Because they're getting more and more confident putting him at the start of his career. It was just, you know, he's got to be with Larkin. Like he's with Larkin, he's with Larkin. And now there's even a little bit more flexibility where they're, you know, he's coming into his own so much where the coaching staff and the organization is giving him, you know, kind of a little bit longer of a leash there. And uh, there's, there's growing confidence in him spreading out his production, even when he's not on that top line with Lark. So, yeah. And I, speaking of Raymond's goal uh, first, the Raymond's goals, Petrie assisted on. So another credit to the defenseman in this hockey game. There you go. But the one we didn't talk about yet. The one we didn't talk about. Uh, as you were saying though, you know, that was a big criticism of Lucas Raymond. This since he got drafted and made the, his debut two seasons ago was that he could not play without Lucas Raymond or without Dylan Larkin. He is Lucas Raymond without Dylan Larkin. And so I think there were a lot of people who are thinking when they took him off the wing a few games ago, or just last game rather that, Oh God, his production is going to, just crater and it hasn't and granted two games but you know in those two games he's proven that he can be a playmaking winger regardless of who his center is sure. so obviously the overtime goal came out came when he was out there with Larkin and Sherrod it was a pass to Larkin but it doesn't matter who he's with he, he's producing results and he's had a great year uh as has Patrick Kane in his abbreviated tenure with the he's Detroit Red Wings so Wings. good dude <laughs> he's so good <laughs> it's it's like funny how good he still is like it actually makes me laugh it's like wow that's actually crazy how how good he still is and just you know going into like his decision and whatnot and how many people obviously myself included in that group um just look like stupid now and how many franchises where if you turned back time would maybe be a little bit more aggressive in pursuing him he'd He's he's really really good at his job. Yes, he is. Uh, with another point in this game, he's got twenty three points in twenty four games at the Detroit Red Wings. He assisted. almost almost man that crossbar. I can uh, somebody somebody tweeted out like after the game ended and said uh, said I can still hear the ping right <laughs> from that. That was a loud that was a loud crossbar, man. But uh, but yeah, it was a beautiful feed to Debrinket who missed the shot. Uh, but it wrapped all the way around. It's back to Patrick is Kane. An understatement. Yeah, he was real wide. Uh, went all the way back to Patrick Kane, who then fed more Sider, who had just an absolute clap on. That was yeah. Patrick Kane's 800, 800th career assist. Yep. And it was more Sider's seventh goal of the season, which ties his career ho career high he set in his rookie year. So just a game full of like, not my, I mean, obviously Kane's is a milestone, but, you know, tying career highs or beating season bests. 
all well, around for the man Detroit cider Red Wings. on that play too just slowly kind of trickled up from the back like really took his time and picked his spot it was a really really high iq play by uh by mo it was an absolute bomb absolute oh, clapper bomb. dude absolute clapper and then uh what you had daniel sprong scored a goal, a goal against his former team scored revenge game baby year. 15th of the season for him Stronger against stronger revenge. He almost had another. He just couldn't lift the puck. He almost had another. There was that one sequence where I think it was Fabry. Oh yeah. In the third period, Fabry had it like open that on one side, go <laughs> leaps across. They get it to sprung on the other side, wide open net. just too many sticks get on his stick. He can't lift the puck. Uh, like it was, it was genuinely, they were just going from one corner to the other wide open net, and neither of them could, uh, could finish but uh yeah the the goal that he did have was a beauty though a good feed by christian fisher too <laughs> that's what he does that's what he's the does. dog right there so i mean as far as notable performances go by individual players i think that about joe valeno i thought had a great game sure right before i move on i just wanted uh he had one really bad turnover in the third period but other than that like he was buzzing trying to get stuff going uh on the wing there so i yeah man what I want to talk about the top line too. I know we talked about Patrick Kane as in a vacuum, but I, I want to talk about the top line too when we come back. But outside of that, I think we're I think we covered about everything in this game, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um that's everybody I had uh or we talked about before for sure. Right. Power play only had one opportunity, didn't score PK. Oh my gosh. I mean, we could talk about that power play if you want. That was uh not great, Bob. Like that was but I think I think at one point, I don't know if it ended, uh, but at one point the Kraken had at least as many, if not more, opportunities than the wings did in their power play. I'll be honest, great. I'm okay not talking about it considering it was their only power play opportunity. So okay it was in the just... first period when the wings were struggling mightily, but yeah. Um, but yeah, dude, you you can't get matched in <laughs> opportunities <laughs> while you're on the power play. It was really, really not great at all. Really rough. Pa- the first period was just bad. Rough passing, a lot of turnovers, a lot of giveaways, et cetera. So yeah, we'll uh, fit, wrap up anything lingering from this hockey game against the Seattle Kraken in segment three. And uh, stay tuned to Lockdown Red Wings. Got to talk to you guys today about Game Time. Game Time is the only ticketing app that gives you complete peace of mind with your purchase. See the view from your seat before you buy so you know exactly what to expect when you arrive. All in prices show your total upfront so you know you're getting a great deal before you check out. Buy tickets in seconds with two taps. They're obsessed with finding ways to help you save money on tickets. Game Time has deals on tickets right up to the start of the event and even an hour after it starts. It's the place to find last minute seats. Find exclusive flash deals and sponsored deals on tickets for football, basketball, baseball, concerts, comedy, theater, and of course, hockey. It's not on here, but hockey, of course. With zone deals, you pick up, you pick the section, and Game Time picks the seats for big time savings. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code Locked On for twenty dollars off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest priced, guaranteed. Segment three, Lockdown Red Wings podcast. I do want to say, you know, obviously Patrick Kane had a pretty good game. He got an assist, his 800th. He was one just a half inch away from scoring the game winner near the end of regulation. But ever since the lines got mixed up just a couple games ago now, it's the second game with the new lines. That top line, I'd feel like, hasn't done a whole lot to producing offense. And while there's like individual moments where they'll have like a moment here or a moment there where they'll be dangerous, I think that there's not enough speed on that line right now with Michael Rasmussen on one wing and Patrick Kane on the other. Obviously, Dylan Larkin has a ton of speed. Uh, but I, I just feel like that line's struggling to break out of the offensive zone and sometimes struggling to break into the offensive zone too, which is crazy considering Kane and Larkin are pretty much the only ones who are consistently can on a normal everyday basis. But I feel like the last two games, that offensive line at the cost of other forward lines, hasn't been able to do as much. The second line obviously has been good. Third and fourth line have been good, but I feel like that first line is kind of getting caved in, uh, especially in the defensive zone, which is surprising considering what Michael Rasmussen brings to the table. Yeah, for sure. I, I also, uh, I mean, for big picture roles like I don't think anybody is holding their breath and expecting Rasmussen to 
like be a fixture on a the top line for a playoff team. Like you know what I mean? Like I, I think he 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 brings he definitely brings that edge. Um, but you know, top line deployment's a whole different beast. Like we talk about it all the time. And um yeah, I, I don't know. I'm I'm uh I don't disagree with you. I, I do think that if you are going to have Debrinkit come for Raymond, like if you really like that second line, then you have a hole that needs to be filled at top line wing, right? Like you, I think that that's a, a pretty fair assessment of that situation. If that's how you want the second line to look, I think you're missing a clear and obvious choice there up top. Um, certainly, you know, those two wingers are not going to bring you a lot of speed. So like, you're definitely, like you're, you're pretty objectively right in that department. I, like whatever they're going to do with line blending and whoever they're trying to to mix and match him with is all in an attempt to get more production and more goal scoring specifically, I should say, at even strength, uh, very specifically, from Alex DeBrinkett. Like I, I just – I feel like that's kind of the overarching theme of th- this entire like mixing and matching and blending and whatnot is just uh, how do we get the most – out of cat. And uh, until that question is answered or until he goes on a heater, because the second that he starts going, scoring goals, like, you know, in bunches or, you know, at even strength specifically on bunches, whoever he's playing with, that's going to be it until he cools down at least, if not longer, right? Like they're going to ride with that hard once they find it. So um, I, I feel like as weird as it is to just continuing to bring him up, even though, you know, your initial point was about Kane and, and Rasmussen, I, I just I feel like that's really the overlying uh, conversation to have with any of how the lines look in the top six for the foreseeable future. Yeah, I mean, I think that's part of it. I think the other part is that they just kind of lack that bona fide top like they have three top six wingers. They don't have a fourth as well. So it's like you said, it's, it's part to bring it part, just trying to find a formula that'll mix every single game. Cause before, you know, two games straight, they had a, in this game in particular, the top line of Larkin Kane uh, and Rasmussen. Michael Rasmussen. Thank you. Had an expected goals, four percentage of 13.39, which again, that's not everything, but it, it is supplemental information to illustrate my point that they did not look good in this game. Obviously, Patrick Kane had a couple of really good moments. I thought Michael Rasmussen had a couple of really good moments. But outside of those moments, in the game as a whole, I thought they were getting kind of killed. And the defense in the defensive zone were getting killed because of that as well. They could not move the puck up the ice. And I, I do think that comes down to lack of speed. But like you look at before that, even when the team kind of, kind of, was, was, kind of winning, the second line, which was what, Comfer, Debrinket, and Kane was getting kind of killed on a, a nightly basis. So it was... It was hard. It's hard to really figure out what your bona fide top six is. It, it could just come down to like they need to continue to play to get the chemistry. Maybe they'll look better. But again, this is back to back wins with this lineup. So, you know, don't maybe not shake what need what's not broken necessarily. But I just, I've seen what this top line has done straight two straight nights and they're your top line. They need to produce. And, you know, outside of a cane assist. You know, Larkin really didn't. Uh, Larkin got the overtime, but that's not with that line. Um, the, the top yeah, line really hasn't seemed like it's done a heck of a lot at five on five. So sure. that's it's just something that I'm keeping my eye on as we go forward. I'm not advocating for breaking it up yet, but if they don't start producing soon, you're going to see lines get shaken up for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, like even when when Ress was per- first put there, I mean, like one of the first things we said was like, yeah, like the, I'm down to try anything, but that's not going to stick. Like, I, you know what I mean? Like, I, no, I, don't, yeah. I don't think. I don't think anybody expects Rasmussen to be the the you know on the uh, on the first line for the remainder of the season. But um, obviously, if they start producing, that'd be awesome. And like then, <laughs> I, I would <laughs> that, that would be great if they start uh, if they start you know lighting the lamp pretty consistently here. That's awesome. So if that does happen, then keep it. Don't mess with a good thing. Like you said, I'm not advocating for him to like get booted off. And uh, you know he was fine, but. Um, I, I think that there's a lot of mixing and matching they're still trying to do, and I think it kind of all revolves around how to get Cat going. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, final thing we got to get to in this episode, just quick standings update for you guys. Uh, now, the Lightning and the Senators are currently in play as we record this, so we don't know the results of that. But with the Red Wings win, they're now one point back of the Tampa Bay Lightning, at least temporarily, for the first wild card spot. 
Uh, the Toronto Maple Leafs did win in this, did beat the St. Louis Blues, so they maintain a four-point gap on you. The Devils did not play. The Islanders did not play. Uh, and then I think that about the, oh Buffalo lost Anaheim, which helps as well. So not a ton of playoff implications. Red Wings hold on to their playoff spot for now. They got four points now on the Devils. Uh, the Devils with a game in hand. And if the Lightning lose, they'll be one point back of that first wild card spot again. So getting back on the schneid and winning two games at the end of that West Coast road trip, I deem it a successful road trip. I said if they split, it's a successful road trip. And they split. So we're good to go. Now, the back half of this month eases up pretty significantly. Now, the next game's a tough one. Colorado at home, though, as Red Wings play at home against Colorado, then against St. Louis at home, go to Chicago, Washington, and New York Islanders finish February at home. So, following the game against Colorado, it's a significantly easier back half of the month, but against some pretty big-time opponents, teams you're fighting for wild card spots with. Yeah, it would be, uh, considering we've played one more game than New Jersey, too, it would be really, really nice if they dropped on Tuesday night. <laughs> it would be. Uh, anyway, Scotty, do you have any final thoughts about anything? Um, I don't think so, man. We ball. All right, we do ball. We'll be back with a new episode tomorrow. Same time, same place. See your team every day. Every day. Every day.